Last week, I, uh, I talked about how uh, this, I started a two-part sermon series uh, on, the, um, uh, on how God seeks those who are lost. And certainly, we had the, um, the lost sheep and the lost coin, and I kept saying that this week I was going to talk about the lost son. Well, Kathy convinced me that the prodigal son is not a good Mother's Day sermon. Uh, it's a good Father's Day sermon, so I'm going to save that. Uh, for Father's Day. And it's interesting because in that one, it's really not about the prodigal son, and it's really not even about the father. It's about the older brother, and we'll see that when we get there. So I'm going to ask you to hold off on that until Father's Day. But for Mother's Day, uh, I thought I would share a, a biblical mother that I believe I've never shared before on Mother's Day, and that is Hagar. Um, now you may be thinking, well, Hagar, she's one of the bad guys. She's not a good, she's not a good part of the story. Well, actually it turns out that Hagar is a wonderful mother. She has some very good qualities and she's in some really tough situations and God blesses her and encourages her. And I hope that looking at, at the life of Hagar, God will bless you and encourage you as a mother. And certainly the truths that we'll find apply to all of us as well. I will, I'll be speaking mainly to mothers, but you understand that this is not just mothers. This is all of us, right? Okay, all right. So as, uh, turn in your Bibles. Uh, we're going to be looking at, um, here we go. We're going to be looking at Genesis 16 and 21 this morning. So the first book of the Bible, real easy to find. Make sure you have that with you. <coughs> uh, not covid just a little, anyway, all right. So um, you'll find that you can trust in the Lord for his concern and for his help. So turn into Genesis 16, and we'll turn to chapter 21 later. Uh, first book of the Bible, 16th chapter, and the first verse. And as we look at Genesis 16, we're going to look at two instances. In the first instance, we'll see that God sees your situation, hears your prayers, and promises a future. In verse 1, um, we find that now Sarai, Abraham's wi Abram's wife, at this point he was called Abram rather than Abraham, uh, she had borne him no children. Now in verse 12, God had called Abram and Sarai and his entire family from where they were into Canaan. Um, and then in, in verse 15, God reiterates the promise, chapter 15, I'm sorry, God reiterates the promise. He makes it very strong, says you're going to have a son and your sentence will be like the stars. Uh, uh, in the sky or the sand on the seashore. But here we are 10 years later, and his wife has not borne him any children. Now, she had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. Now, it's very interesting when you look at the Old Testament and you see these servants or slaves. Sometimes she's called a slave, sometimes she's called a servant. And it's really unclear whether she was an indentured servant, that she had sold herself or her family had sold her uh, into servitude uh, to earn some money, maybe a, a, a uh, uh, way of buying food or something when there was a famine. Or maybe she was actually a slave and been sold hand to hand. And, and certainly we, we would be disappointed with Abram and Sarai, but that was their culture. And the main thing to point out is that Hagar is in a situation where she doesn't have a lot of choices, whether she's a slave or an indentured servant, she's stuck. She's in a situation where she has to do what is said. And we find that, so uh, that, uh, I'm sorry, let's go back to, uh, to verse two. Um, Sarai said to Abram, behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. Literally, the passage says that I may build a house, um, that I may build a house for her. Uh, and that was a very common thing in that culture, that if the, the first wife had not born children, that she could bring in a concubine, a servant, and have children through that, and, and they would be called her children, and she would build her house. We see this happening with, um, um, with Jacob with uh, Israel and his four wives, two real wives, two, it, it's a mess. Anyway, it wasn't God's plan 
wasn't the way God wanted to do it. He'd made a promise, but here had been 10 years. And so um, Sarah, Sarai, at this point, as she's called, has a solution. So in verse 3, we see, so after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. Now, it's important to note that she wasn't just a slave who was put into, into this position. She was made to be a second wife to Abram. Uh, not good, but certainly she's, she has certain rights and privileges. She's no longer treated as a slave. She is another wife. Um, not, a, not a good situation. Not something that she, I'm sure she would have chosen. Now, yes, being elevated from uh, indentured servanthood or slavery to be a, a member of the household, that, that's a, a good thing probably for her. But she didn't have any choice. We find in verse 4 that he went into Hagar and she conceived. When she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Now, this is a bit of a false step here. Uh, Hagar has conceived. The plan has worked so far as it went. Um, and she's, she's, she's pregnant. She knows that she's pregnant. And Sarai is still barren. So... She's looking down on Sarai. I've conceived. I've done well. I've done my job. And you haven't. We find another place in the Bible with Hannah, uh, the prophet Samuel's mother, that she was barren and her, the other wife in the household, always a bad idea. The other wife in the household looked down on, on Hannah because she had not conceived. And it was misery to her. It drove her to God in earnest, heartbreaking prayer. So uh, Sarah's reaction, if you look in verse 5, Sarah said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. I tell you, Abram can't win. Um, it's, it's, it is his fault that he didn't depend on the promise. He let Sarai come up with another solution that God had not even suggested. God had said that Sarai would have a child, and it hadn't happened, so Sarai came up with this. Abram went along with it. Kind of a, kind of a picture of the Garden of Eden, that Eve had a different plan than God had. Adam went along with it, and you see the mess that that's gotten us into. If you really want to know where COVID-19, it came from right there, from the fall, from us disobeying God, from us choosing our own plans. So Abram does the right thing. He stands up. No. He capitulates. Abram said to Sarai, behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. He's kind of washing his hands of it. This wasn't my idea. This was your idea. You go for it. And then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. This word harshly we're going to see again, because it has as its root the idea that she humiliated her. You know, whether it was cleaning out chamber pots, maybe it was uh, washing the sheep, maybe it was stu stupid make work, um, Maybe it was you do all the cleaning, every single thing, every single garment, you're going to be the one to clean it. But she just humiliated her. She made sure that she was totally humbled. And Hagar fled. She had enough. I can't handle this. And where she fled, um, we see in, um, uh, in verse 6, um, I'm sorry, we'll actually, we'll see it later, that she fled the land of Shur. Now, this was the area that was kind of south and west of Israel, north and east of Egypt. She was from Egypt, right? So she's probably heading home, going home to mama, uh, going home to dad. And she had to cross this very barren area here. Uh, not a lot there, but she was determined. She was not going to put up with it. 
And notice the, uh, I'm sorry, notice in, uh, in verse 7, the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. So the angel of the Lord finds her. And he says, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? The angel of the Lord. This is the first instance in the Old Testament about the angel of the Lord. He's mentioned 48 times in the Old Testament, three times in this chapter, in this encounter. This has got to be pretty significant for Hagar. And there's some question as to, is this simply a, a heavenly messenger? You'll find later that she recognizes that this is not just a messenger. This is an encounter with God. It may be that the angel was clearly speaking for God, that it was so represented, the angel was so representative of God that that's what Hagar's conclusion was. Some Bible scholars figure that this was actually the, a vision of a man, but also God. There was a pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Jesus, that Jesus is actually talking to her. So whether it's an angel of the Lord or God or Jesus himself, she's pretty important. <laughs> Hagar has gotten the attention of heaven. And notice what the angel says. Hagar servant of Sarai. He identifies her. This is your role. This is who you are. You have been a servant. And he says, where have you come from? What's going on in your life? What situation has given rise to you abandoning your role of being a servant and fleeing out here in the middle of nowhere? And then where are you going? What's your plan? What do you tend to make of this? I have every confidence that this angel of the Lord, whether it be Jesus, whether it be God speaking through a messenger, he knows. He knows the answer to all three of these questions. You're the servant. Does God know who you are? Does he know the situation that you're in? Does he know how difficult it is? Does he know how challenging it is? Where are you coming from? What experiences have led up to this moment in your life? What has brought you to this point, whether it be a point of, I'm good, or whether it be a point of, I cannot handle this. This is just bigger than me. And then, what are you thinking? What are you thinking the next step might be? In your own thinking, in your own planning, how are, you, how are you going to handle this? You see, God comes to you and meets you and knows you. But more importantly, he wants you to know yourself. He wants you to understand what's going on in your life. Verse 9 says that the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. Whoa. Thank you very much. You, you know what I've come from. You know why I'm trying to get away, and you're telling me to return. It's interesting that word return is a word that's used in the Old Testament for repent. It's literally, I'm going one direction, and God wants me to turn around and go the other direction. Where I'm heading with my sin and where it's leading me is the wrong way. It's away from God. I need to go back towards God and towards his plans for me and what he intends for me. It's, it's, it's the word for repent. So he's saying to, to Hagar, this is not God's plan for you. You're headed in the wrong direction. You need to repent and go back to where I have you. And he says, submit to Sarah. I don't know about you, but if I had been Hagar, I might have been thinking, no, no, this, this really doesn't work. You see, you don't understand. You don't understand what I've been through. You don't know what struggles I have. You don't know what's best for me. Isn't that what we're tempted to say to God sometimes? But you know that God knows what you've been through. 
you know that he knows what's best for you. And you know that his plans, his future, are what you're going to need to do. And when he says, submit to her, it's a form of the same word of being treated harshly. He's really saying, she humiliated you, now you humble yourself. You take on the trouble. You grab hold of the difficulty. You put yourself in the position where you can be frustrated. Now, I, moms, I get it. If there's one thing I've learned uh, from being a father is that kids are humiliating. <laughs> kids will put you in positions that you never thought you'd be in. I remember the first really big diaper I changed. Oh my goodness. I, I just knew at that point, I'm not going to be able to handle this. I came so close to just walking away. But Kathy was out of town, so that really wasn't an option. And you know that's why I was changing the diaper, because Kathy was out of town. If someone had seen me at that point, they would have said, you're not a strong man. You're not a good father. And they would have been right. Kids do things to us that just crush us. They just take away all of our pride. If you want pride and dignity, parenting is not for you. I remember my mom saying so often, this is why I can never have nice things. This is why I cannot have a nice, beautiful house, because I got kids running around. Yeah, that's true. When God calls you to motherhood, he calls you to humble yourself, to submit to what he's doing in those kids' lives, to submit to his larger plan. But then he gives her a promise. He gives her an encouragement. He just doesn't leave her hanging there. He says to her, I will surely multiply your offspring in verse 10 so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. He gives her a promise that there's something bigger going on here. You had, you, you thought everything was breaking up. Everything was falling apart but actually it was building up. See, Hagar, I'm surely felt that she'd been abandoned by God. She'd been put in an impossible situation. And God is saying, no, you're going to have a son. Uh, he says in verse 11, uh, behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. And you shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. I mean, she knew she was pregnant. She didn't need God, the angel to tell her that. But, she now finds that it's a son. And it's to give him the name Ishmael. Now, Ishmael literally means God hears. What an encouragement. She's in this terrible situation. She, it just, it, it can't, it's not working. It's not going to work. But God hears her cry. God hears her situation. He has listened to your humiliation to your pain. He's, he's going to do something about it. He goes on to say in verse 12, he will be a wild donkey of a man, his hands against everyone, everyone's hands against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. Well, that's not very encouraging. <laughs> You're going to have a difficult child. He's going to be stubborn. He's not going to be well-liked. But hang in there, because it's a part of the plan. And this was indeed an encouragement to Hagar. Verse 13 says, She called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God of seeing. For she said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. God says, I hear. And then she says, And you also see. Does God see your affliction? Does God see your difficulties? Does God see your challenges? Of course he does. He knows exactly where you are. He can hear every thought of your heart. He can see every situation in your life. And he has plans for it. I've seen him who looks after me. In uh, we find that um, 
there was a well there. Uh, it was called Bir Lahai Roy. Ra'i. There we go. Roy. Yeah. And uh, it's called the well of the living one who sees me. And um, Hagar bore, verse 15, it's the last, the last couple of verses of chapter 16. Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the, called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abraham. Ten years after the promise. And he has a son. And we find that Abram loved that son. So we see from chapter 16, that first encounter, that God sees your situation, hears your prayers, and promises a future. Now we're going to skip forward a few years to chapter 21. So turn your Bible to chapter 21, just a few chapters over. And we're going to start with verse 8 in chapter 21. But we're going to see that God rescues you in your most confusing and painful times. In chapter 16, God saw the situation and he said, go back to it. He didn't say he was going to take it away. He said he was going to do something bigger through it. But in chapter 21, we have a different situation. Now, a little background here in 21. The first, chapter, first part of chapter 21, if you'll see in your Bible, is the actual promised one, that Isaac is born when Abram is 100 years old. So this is 14 years later. And... Uh, it's kind of a weird thing going on here because you have the child of the promise and you've got the child of the slave woman. Um, and you kind of wonder what was going on there. But there's this celebration there in verse 8 of chapter 21. The child grew and was weaned and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. It is a, um, uh, a tremendous celebration there. That, now when he was weaned, he was probably like three years old. Uh, kids nursed for a long time back then. You didn't have formula and bottles and baby food jars with Gerber and all that stuff. Um, and so a, a child would, uh, would be on the breast for quite a while. But while they're having the celebration, Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abram, laughing. Okay. Now, at this point, Sarai is called Sarah. She has changed her role. She really has been the mother of the promise. She has seen God fulfilled in her life, and she looks at this previous plan. She looks at what was not working. Ishmael isn't even named here. It's the son of Hagar, the Egyptian. And he's laughing. Now, Isaac's name means laughter, so what's wrong with him laughing? Well, the word probably means that he was mocking. He was scorning. He's probably 17 at this point. He's a teenager. He's almost a man. And maybe he's thinking God has already fulfilled the promise. He's given a man to, to Father Abraham. And this is a little baby who's just barely been weaned. What kind of promise is he? Well, the, um, this does not sit well with Sarah. So she said to Abra Abraham, cast out this save, slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. Now this is a horrible thing. This is a terrible thing. The, uh, the laws of the land in those days, archaeology uh, tells us that um, if there was a situation where the first wife was barren, then there could be a concubine to build up children for that first wife, and she would call them her own. Um, but if the wife then had children, the concubine, the second wife, could not be put out. That was just wrong. And this is wrong. Abram doesn't react well to it. He says in verse 11, Abraham said, I did it because, I'm sorry, whoop, whoop, there we go, there we go. In verse 11, uh, and this thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. This is his firstborn son, Ishmael is. Isaac is the son of promise, but Ishmael is the first son of his body. He's raised him. He's taught him to hunt. He's probably taught him how to use the bow and arrow. He's, he loves his kid. But he also loves Sarah. And Sarah is saying, this has got to change. 
I need drastic action here. And Abraham is caught between a rock and a hard place. He'd, he'd given in before, but he'd grown to love this child. What can he do? And a very unusual thing happens in verse 12. God says to Abraham, be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever says, Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Huh. This is, this is wrong. This is not good. And God is saying, go along with it. You know, sometimes from our human perspective, we, we just don't get it. It's hard to see what God is really doing in the big picture. So often you and I look at the, the immediate picture, what's right in front of us, and we say, this is wrong, this is broken, this clearly can't be God's will. This doesn't match with our preconceived ideas. But sometimes God is doing something much bigger. He's got the long plan. He can see the end from the beginning and here with our limited vision, we, we, see it, we say it's, it's wrong, it doesn't make sense, it hurts. But God does have that bigger vision. There in, uh, in verse 13, he says, I, and I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. God gives a promise here that it's going to be all right. And verse 14, 14 says, so Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness, wilderness of Beersheba. Abraham does it. Doesn't seem right to him. God assures him there's a bigger plan going on here. In trust, he moves, he moves ahead. Now, it's interesting. I, I tried to find some pictures of uh, what people thought this might have looked like. Um, and almost 100% the artists who have painted this scene picture a child, because it says child here. But remember, he's probably 16, 17 years old. So you have this, this sad picture of uh, Hagar being cast out, her little child. He's probably bigger than that. But it is a wilderness that they're going into. And um, we certainly find there in verse 15, when the water in the skin was gone, She put the child under one of the bushes. She's been wandering in the wilderness. She doesn't know the way home. She doesn't have a clear idea like she had for 17 years ago, 18 years ago. She puts the child under one of the bushes. She's a good mom. In this wilderness, there's probably only a little bit of shade, and she gives it to her child. She, she stays out in the heat of the sun, in the blistering of the wind, she protects her child. Hagar is a good mother. She went to sit and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. So it's a pretty good distance that she's away. And she says, let me not look on the death of the child. And she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. She's a good mother, she has a heart for her child. I know each of you mothers, you, you love your children. Sometimes you want to strangle them, but you love them. You want them to be safe. You want things to be good for them. And when it's not, it hurts. When they're sick, when they're in the hospital. I, I know that you're being very careful about this whole COVID-19 thing because you do not want to see your child sick. I mean, the, the odds of it, if your child is healthy, are pretty low. But that's not stopping you from protecting them. <laughs> You want to do every single thing you can. But here it's pretty clear that she and the child are going to die. She and this, this young, young boy in the cusp of manhood is not going to see his full years. He's going to die. And she weeps. And God heard the voice of the, the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not. For God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. I want you to notice a couple of things. She puts him in the shade. She collapses in the sun. And she weeps. And God says, 
I hear the boy. Probably Ishmael was, he, he knows what's happening. He, he knows that he has a future ahead of him. His father has just tossed him out on his ear. And he's probably crying out to God as well. Help me, save me. Here we don't hear it's the angel of the Lord. We hear very clearly that it's God from heaven. The angel of God says to Hagar, what troubles you? Again, when God asks you a question, be certain that he already knows the answer, right? He's got this. Um, and then he says what seems to almost always be said when God addresses fear not. And I believe this is a message to all mothers. Fear not. The, the biggest challenge, I think, for motherhood is that monster called fear. That monster that says, I look at the situation, I see everything going on, this is terrifying. This is going to be awful. And God always says, fear not. We've already seen in Luke and certainly in, in Matthew chapter uh, 6, don't be anxious because your fear isn't going to fix anything. Hagar's terror of her son dying that she doesn't even want to look at or to hear, don't fear. For God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. What, what is Ishmael's name? God hears. God hears Ishmael. God hears the situation that she's in, that he's in. What a tremendous promise. I want to pick up uh, verse uh, 18 for you. Up, lift up the boy, hold him fast with your hand, for I'll make him into a great nation. Remember the promise? Remember what God had already said? Yeah, yeah, it was 17, 18 years ago. But it's still true. God has a plan for Ishmael. God has a plan for you. Remember. He made his promises. Don't just lay down and die here. Pick him up, grab him by the hand, lead him where I'm going to show you. And then he shows her. God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water there in verse 19. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. Oh, what a tremendous promise. What a... What a wonderful sight that must have been to, to Hagar and to Ishmael. God provides. You see, when you or I are in a terrible situation, all we can see is the loss and the hurt and the pain. But God can see what he's got over the next hill. God can see what he's promised. He's promised good for you. Romans 8.28 says that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord, who are called according to his purposes. It's not a blank check, but it does say that if you love God and you're in tune with his purposes, he's got good things for you. Fear not. Hang in there. And certainly, God was with the boy and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with a bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. One final encouragement I want to give you moms. Notice that she got to choose her boy's wife. Wouldn't that be great if you could choose the husband for your sons? I'm sorry, the wife for your sons. There we go. So that messed up here. The wife for your sons, the husband for your daughters. Wouldn't that be great? Sorry, you can't. It, uh, you got to live with, teach them well. Teach them to choose well. <laughs> Build things into their lives because whoever they choose you're going to have to live with them. They'll make a major impact on your life and your family's life. Don't want to scare you. Just want to give you some encouragement that Hagar, as troubled as her life was, she had the pleasure of doing this. So remember, God rescues you in your most confusing and painful times. There is a God you can trust and depend on. Certainly, trust in the Lord for his concern and for his help. Let me ask you a few questions as we finish up here. What is the most difficult thing you're facing right now? This is for moms, maybe for the rest of us too. 
Is it the COVID-19? Is it the uncertainty about when is this going to end? Is it your child's health? Is it your parents' health? Is it your own? What's the most difficult thing that is just churning in your life right now? Secondly, in what ways are you crying out and seeking God? Hagar and Ishmael, they both cried out. And that's good. Sometimes you do just have to go to God and say, this hurts, this stinks, help me, Lord. So often you and I just, we, we take the, the stance of, yeah, life is hard, just makes you stronger, I'm just going to hang in there. God likes it when you cry out to him. God answers, he, he hears, and he sees. Can you trust his plan no matter what? I know in my own life, God's plans have taken quite a few twists and turns. Uh, this month, Kathy and I will be celebrating our 43rd wedding anniversary. And we've been talking about some of the major things that are going on. Friday, Kathy gave a talk on, um, on the ministry in these past 30, um, almost 33 years. And so, um, and all the different twists and turns. There's probably some twisty, turny things in your life, too. Can you trust them? Even when it doesn't look good, fear not. Trust him. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that we can trust you. I thank you that you see us and you hear us. Lord, I pray for the moms who are going through difficult circumstances. I pray that you would bless them, not just this day, but all days, with a confidence and a joy that you've got this. Lord, I pray that we all might turn to you in absolute trust and confidence. Lord, I pray for those who aren't sure still whether you hear them, whether you see them. They're not convinced yet that you truly care for them. Lord, I pray you would help them to, to do what the angel of the Lord commanded Hagar at the beginning, to return. Help them to return, to turn around from where they're going, to go towards you and the plans you have for them. Lord, help them to confess that they've been on the wrong path, that their own rebellion, their sin, is what they need forgiveness for. Help them, Lord, to repent and to claim you, ask for your forgiveness, invite you into their lives so they might be fully agreement with your plans. And Lord, I do pray for those who, who have trusted you, that they and we would continue to trust you, no matter what happens, because you are the God who loves us through Jesus. You've given us everything. We can trust you for this. Amen.